Well, let's uh, join together in prayer, and then we'll open our Bibles at Psalm 77. Father, may your word cause us to meditate and to give thanks that you have revealed yourself in all the circumstances of our lives, that you are indeed the faithful God who is with us in all circumstances and situations. And we ask that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Amen. While we're looking at Psalm 77, uh, there is a bit of connection, uh, hopefully, uh, that we can have into the book of Exodus, uh, which will start next week. Um, we see in this psalm that it speaks of the steadfast love of the Lord, but it's a psalm of lament. Uh, it mightn't sound very encouraging, but there's a, about a third of the psalms that are actually given over to lament, either personally or corporately. And this is a corporate lament by Asaph, the psalmist, uh, in the corporate community of God's people. And of course, uh, you have the book of Lamentations that gives us that wonderful verse. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. And they're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Well, it's good to ask ourselves, what is a lament according to the Bible? Some would say it's a lament is a, a loud cry or an expression of grief that gives voice to our words and to our emotions. You think of Jesus himself was lamenting when he quoted from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So a lament wrestles with all kinds of circumstances in life that raise difficult questions for us. The seeming absence of God at times. The presence of trials and troubles. What's the mystery of his purposes? A lament can make us ask a few questions. Where are you, God? If you love me, why is all this happening? But again, we need to remember that to lament is not to be faithless. It is not to be without faith. It is actually an act of faith. And you can read that in many of the Psalms. The lament is part of what it means to be a believer who is calling out in faith from his heart to God. It's a cry of faith. How long, O Lord? We see that in the book of Habakkuk. So the Christian believer, a lament is really a prayer. It's a cry. It's a believing heart that has pain-filled confusion at times. So lament is an act of faith where we seek to, res to, to, to resist the temptation to stop talking to God. That's the worst thing we can do. It expresses to God what he already knows about our hearts. So Psalm 77 is a lament that, that provides us with an example, among many others in the Psalms, of, of a corporate lament of Asaph, for the people of God. There's an honest struggle going on in the psalmist's heart. There's a deep pain and there's lots of questions. So it's a prayerful lament that finds its hope in the ultimate moment that God's word brings to us. We're reminded at the end there that verse 15 talks about the redemption of the people of God. Uh, 
the opening of the Red Sea, the deliverance from the slavery in Egypt, and the exodus and the Red Sea crossing, God's power is shown in the midst of their lament. So we're going to look at this just under two simple headings. One is praying with honesty of heart, and the other is remembering the works and the wonders of God. Now you can see this painful cry, can't you, in the opening verses. He says, I cry, notice verse 1, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, so he repeats himself, and he will hear me. So he's not silent. The psalmist has not given up talking to God in spite of his painful cry. He's praying out loud to God earnestly in prayer. Look at, look at what he says. Verse 2, in the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I mourn. When I meditate, and my spirit faints, is the ESV version. But look at what he's saying. He's reminding us that even in his lament, he is confident that God will hear him. He is in the day of trouble seeking the Lord. He's still pursuing God through honest prayer. In the night, he says, his hand is stretched out without wearying. Perhaps speaking of the posture of prayer. So he's reaching out to God in his lament. He has faith in God, even though things are tough. He pours out his complaints and his heartaches and his emptiness. Not with bitterness, with the cry of an honest heart. It's a prayerful lament. And surely that is better than silence and despair. He's communicating with God. There is a relationship with his God. And in every relationship, there must be meaningful communication. That happens in any human relationship, any marriage relationship, it's a good place to start, that that we communicate. And the same thing is true in terms of our relationship with God, isn't it? It's tempting at times in the challenges of life to stop praying to God, isn't it? It's tempting to give up. It's tempting to doubt that he doesn't hear. He's not there. So you can sense the, the psalmist's emotional struggle within himself. My soul, he says, refuses to be comforted. But he's not running away from God. He's running towards him. When he remembers God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. So he's he's continuing to call upon God because there's a relationship. If you have a relationship, there's got to be communication. But then he goes on, doesn't he, in verses 5 following. He's, He's making some raw, pointed questions, isn't he? He says, I consider the days of old, the years of long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. So he's, he, he's, he's trying to turn away from his pain and suffering to consider God. And of course... It does lead him to ask difficult questions, doesn't it? He's trying to recall God's past mercies. But then, 
as James quite helpfully demonstrated, you have these uh, six questions, don't you, from, from verse 7 on. He says, I'll remember my song in the night, and I will meditate with my heart, and my spirit ponders. Then he lists these uh, six really rhetorical questions. Will the Lord spurn me forever? Will the Lord spurn me forever? Will he never again be favorable? Verse 7. Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Verse 8. Are his promises at an end for all time? Again, verse 8. Has God forgotten to be gracious? Verse 9. Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Verse 9. Now notice, he's questioning the favor, love, promises, faithfulness, and compassion of God. And talking that way certainly has, brings difficult emotions, doesn't it? We know that his, his feelings and his thoughts are not based on truth. And yet they feel true for him. And you know what it's like for us. We feel one way one day and another way another day. And what we feel is not always what is true. Alec Mateer, in his uh, very helpful book in the Psalms, he says this, he says, he says on a calm, trouble-free day, the answers to these six questions in verses 7 to 9 would be obvious. God has not spurned him. He has not forgotten to be favorable. He has steadfast love. He's not forgotten to be gracious and so on. But, says Mateer, in this prolonged period of soul-destroying adversity, the psalmist can ask the questions, but on the basis of experience cannot venture a sure answer. It reminds us that God is unchanging, but we are prone to change from one day to the next. And as we've said earlier, Jesus himself said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So the answers of the scripture to the questions that he's asking, will the Lord reject them forever and, and, and all the rest of them? The answer of the Bible is no. It's no. For example, you read Psalm 103. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in loving kindness. He goes on. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our inequities. For this God, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him, who even lament to him. As far as the east is from the west, he says, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Again, just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our freedom. He knows our freedom. And he is mindful that we are but dust. So the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, even for those who lament. James Montgomery Boyce is, or was a, a minister in America, sadly died in his 50s. 
But he says this. He's written many books and commentaries. James Montgomery Boyce said this. It is better to ask them, that is, ask the questions. It is better to ask them than not to ask them. Because asking, because asking them sharpens the issue and pushes us towards the right positive response. Boyce again says, one thing you have to say about Asaph, he tells it like it is. He's respectful, but, but if he's unhappy or puzzled about what God is doing or not doing, he says so, and God can handle it. He knows that God is able to handle the difficult questions and cries of our lives. And the danger that we face in such times, isn't it? That we stop talking to God. And it's a challenge to us, isn't it? Is there anything that we've stopped talking to God about? The scriptures remind us, as Asaph does here, that the days of trouble are to be the days of prayers that has his complaints and his troubles and his darkness. God did not stop listening to the psalmist. So we're to pray honestly, knowing that God is hearing. Secondly, we're to remember the past. Not, not to... Not to glorify the past, but we're to remember the good things of the past. And that goes from verse 10. Then I said, so there's a, a change here. Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has his anger shut up? His compassion, verse 9. Then in verse 10, then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the Most High God. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember the wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. He's remembering. He's appealing to the God of the Most High. He's remembering the deeds of the Lord. And of course, among those was the deliverance of Egypt, the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. In verse 11 and 12, the psalmist has shown us the way out of the pit of our darkness. Yes, he says, I will remember your wonders of old. Verse 12, I will ponder all your work. I will meditate on all your mighty deeds. He's remembering that God is faithful. God has proved himself to be someone who can be trusted. He's remembering the unchanging character of God, the steadfast love of God. Now we know that we battle against our own flesh, the world, and the devil. And the devil will feed all kinds of things into our minds. But we're to remember the past, we're to remember the works and the wonders of God for the people of Israel, for his covenant people. We're to remember how he ever lives to make intercession for us in all the circumstances of our lives. He hasn't changed. And we're to remember the character of God. You see it there in, uh, in uh, verse 13. It says, your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people. Going back to the Exodus. You redeemed your people. And you know, the people of God were grumbling, complaining people, sometimes like us. You redeemed your people 
the children of Jacob and Joseph. So he's remembering the great events of the past. God is holy. He's great. Who's a God like our God? A God who redeems. A God who rescues. A God who buys back at a great price his people. And then in the closing verses, 16 to 20, you have this scene of the Old Testament, a very well-known story in the Bible. You recognize the language, don't you? It's, he's recalling the greatest redemption, if you like, the greatest uh, rescue in the world. When the waters saw you, O God, verse 16, when the waters saw you, they were afraid, and indeed the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water, the skies gave forth thunder, the arrows flashed on every side, and so it goes on. Your way, verse 19, your way was through the sea. Your way, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. It's one of the most remarkable scenes in the whole of the Bible, isn't it? He's recalling the God who delivers them from slavery. And leads them through the Red Sea. And ultimately enter the, promise bar, enter the promised land. And so what he draws from that is if God can shepherd his people through the turmoil of the Red Sea. Then God can shepherd his people in all the valleys of life. So it's a prayerful lament with hope and with resolution. There is a relationship with God and his people. He has worked to free them and to rescue them from the slavery of Egypt. And God has worked in such a way through his own son that he's rescued us from the hopelessness and despair and a lost eternity. So these closing verses speak about the Red Sea and the crossing, defining moments in the life of the history of Israel. God's power and care is evident. Asaph's questioning heart is taken back to the works and the wonders of God. Through honest prayer and through remembering the works and wonders of the God who does the impossible. Talks about your way through the sea, your footprints. You led your people. There was no greater moment in Israel's history. The Exodus was an anchor for the weary souls of the trodden Israelites. And for all true Christian believers today, New Testament believers today, yes, we look back to the crossing of the Red Sea, but we look up to the cross of Christ alone. For our rescue. The cross of Jesus on which, says the hymn writer, the Prince of Glory died. The cross of Jesus that dealt with our real sin and gave us a real Savior. The cross of Jesus is the place where we found deliverance 
where we found the reality of who Jesus is and why he came and how he died. It's a lament, yes. But again, when you come to the Gospels, the cry of the cross, the cry of the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Gives way to the words in Matthew 28, 6. He is not here. He is not here. He has risen. That is where we look this morning. We look to him. We look to the cross. We keep looking to the cross. That's why believers can say with Paul, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Romans 18, 18. Romans 8, 18. So the lament eventually leads the psalmist to resolution and leads us to see that our hope is always in the cross and only in the cross. It's at the throne of God where we can pray and reflect and remember and give thanks and make our requests made known. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. Just the foundation of our hope, the cross, the shed blood of Christ, the glorious news of the gospel, that our lives can be changed, that there can be meaning, that yes, there's hardships, yes, there's trials, there's difficulties, there's confusions, because we live in a broken world. And our feelings aren't always right. But God has proved to us, surely, if you've been a Christian any length of time, God has proved to us again and again that he is for us and not against us. That he is present when we feel he's so absent. We're taught by the lament of Asaph, the moments of despondency. And yet we're taught to remember how to pray. We're taught to remember the great things that God has done and is doing and will continue to do in this world. He's continuing to rescue We just heard about the persecuted believers. He's continuing to rescue people in many and very different ways and places. He's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who went to the cross, who died for our sins, who rose again, who has ascended to the right hand of God And he will come again. This is our God. Who sent his one and only son to pay a debt that we could not pay. To free us from a condemnation that we could never free ourselves from. And we see that in the book of Exodus. That's why the law and the prophets. Isn't that what Jesus said to the disciples on the Emmaus Road? about the scriptures of the Old Testament. Some people say, well, we're New Testament believers. We are, but the story begins in the Old. And it's a wonderful story. And it's culminated in the one and only Son of God who paid our debt to set us free from our sin. And so as we come to the book of Exodus in the coming weeks, a story that's known well to us. Let's pray that we might see again the wonders of God. Let's see that our hearts are anchored in 
the cross of Christ, in the gospel of Christ, and that our dependence is on our King and our Savior. Remember his amazing grace that can help us to pray earnestly, to remember his great works, to continually approach him as the God and King that he is, and to do it with hope and assurance that one day God will make everything right. And in days when it seems the devil is just wiping the floor with us, that we will trust the Lord. Judge not the Lord, says the hymn writer. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Well, that's the wonderful words of the psalmist. What then shall we say, says Paul in Romans 8? What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Let's pray. Our great God and Father in heaven, we bow before you. We're so prone to think that we're forgotten and forsaken when you tell us that we are never forsaken. Lord, our feeble hearts question and doubt. But you remind us again and again and again that we belong to you. Help us, we pray, to respond with thanksgiving for your mercies. Help us to commit ourselves to you day by day and to rest in you alone, in Christ alone. For you are our strength, you are our hope, and in your name we trust. Help us as we soon part from this place to continue to pray and to remember.